Lord suffered in his body and in his soul. And if we were to attempt to quantify it, we would have to say that his suffering in his soul was the greater. Our Lord suffered from the hour of his birth to the hour of his death. And his sufferings were manifold. At a more basic, and you could even say, a very human level, for these things are common to all mankind, he suffered hunger, thirst, tiredness, sadness, and grief, though to a much greater level than us. <coughs> Part of his sufferings too was that though he were he was the ruling and king of the universe, with all the riches that applied. He suffered poverty. Right from his lowly birth, when he had a manger for a crib, to times when he had not where to lay his head. Our Lord's temptations are also part of his sufferings. For Hebrews 12, 2 verse 18 states, He, quote, suffered being tempted. That is suffering, to be tempted. And when we think about our Lord's temptations, we especially recall his three great temptations in the wilderness that our brother Reverend Lionheart preached upon a few weeks back. <coughs> the sufferings of Christ then include his being reproached and slandered and mocked is being betrayed and denied and rejected and is being hated. Is being cordially hated by men. Is being hated without cause. That is, without a just cause. They did have cause, but it was a very unjust cause. They hated. And if we add to this, the sufferings that were involved in his arrest, in his imprisonment, in his trial, and in his crucifixion, the picture is coming yet clearer. Sufferings which can be conveyed in very simple evocative names like Gethsemane, like Gabbatha, like Calvary, and all of those words we call to us. And from what has already been said, in general, you should, to some extent, be able to appreciate, at least somewhat, the opening words of answer 37, that Christ suffered all the time that he lived on earth. Why though did he suffer all the time? What's the reason for this? Why did this have to be so? At a very basic level, Christ's suffering is necessary because of what is called his state of humiliation. His state of humiliation, I'll explain this. This means that from our Lord's conception to the moment just prior to his glorification, he was guilty. He was guilty for our sins. And he was guilty for our sins because they were imputed to him and reckoned to his Account. And because his legal state was guilty, that's what's meant by a state of humiliation, because his legal state was guilty, his condition, what he experienced, was misery. Because he was guilty, that's his legal state, God made him suffer misery. 
So in his condition, what he experienced was appropriate to his legal state as that of a guilty person. When I speak of Christ's condition as being that of misery, we mean the misery of suffering. The misery of suffering for all of our sins, all of the sins of all the elect in all ages, and suffering for all of our sins from his conception just up to his resurrection, that is, lifelong misery of suffering for us. You could put it like this, his misery and suffering for us, that's his wretched condition, what he experienced, his misery which is his suffering for us is co-extensive with his state of humiliation, his legal status as guilty. We could go further. We could say that if our sins were not imputed to Christ, and if Christ were not guilty on our behalf, and if he were not punished for them, then it would have been unjust of God to cause his son to suffer and to have a lowly birth and to be revived of men. Only because our sins were imputed to Christ, only because he was guilty for us his entire life, was it right, was it fitting? That our Savior suffer at all. Otherwise, it would have been right in justice of God to have His Holy One suffer anything at all. <clears throat> Another argument for our Lord's lifelong suffering for us is that His suffering cannot be confined to the cross. Now obviously our Lord did suffer on the cross. Many scriptures affirm this. Isaiah 53 for instance which we read earlier. This is the time when our Lord especially suffered for us. And the Bible particularly emphasizes his suffering on the tree. But we cannot confine Christ's sufferings to Calvary. Jesus Christ also suffered and suffered for us when he was beaten by the soldiers. Isaiah 53 says that he was bruised for our iniquities and with his stripes the blows when he was whipped with his stripes we are healed. And Christ was beaten by the soldiers before the cross. And it very obviously was suffering for us. So if you say the sufferings of Christ for us are only on the cross, then you're going to have to also say, well, and by the cross, I include his beating just prior to his being impaled on the wood. But then, then, you're also going to have to go a bit further back behind that because the Lord Jesus surely also suffered for us at his trial which preceded the cross and preceded his beating. Question 38 yes, asks, why did he suffer under Pontius Pilate as judge? The answer is that he, being innocent, yet condemned by a temporal judge, that was the mechanism, so to speak, that God used to free us from His divine judgment to which we were exposed. So Christ is reckoned guilty and condemned by a temporal judge so that we might not be condemned by the divine judge. That is, Christ is, suffers as a convicted criminal 
so that we might not be convicted by God for our sins, that is, he's suffering for us at his trial, at his trial too. So it's the cross, yeah, and it's his beating, and it is his trial where he is suffering for us. And you can see where this is going. Our Lord also suffered for us in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he sweated as it were great drops of blood, which ought to make us think of the blood that he is about to shed. He's already anticipating and entering into the terrible suffering of the cross, because it is that awful prospect of the cross that appalls him and shakes him to the core. He's suffering for us, even as he contemplates and enters into that suffering at Gethsemane. So if someone were to confine our Savior suffering for us to the cross, we'd say, well, what about the preceding events? What about when he was scourged? What about when he was condemned at his trial? What about his sufferings at Gethsemane? The person I trust would have to concede, yes, those were sufferings for us. They then could try to widen the cross and say that when Christ suffered at the cross, I'm confining his sufferings for us to the cross, I'm including those major events just prior to Calvary. We would respond to that, well that's stretching things a bit, isn't it? Gethsemane was on the other side of the river Kidron. The events in Gethsemane took place on the night and therefore day, at least by our reckoning, before the cross. And then we want to say too, that the shadow of the cross, the shadow of the cross, was always lying across our Lord all his days. He came, he kept saying, to do the will of him that sent me. And he knew what the will of him that sent me was. He said, I have a cup to drink. And even the thinking of that cup was suffering. There's another helpful way of grasping our Lord's lifelong suffering for us, and that is what I may call the analogy of his lifelong obedience for us. These two, Christ's lifelong obedience for us and his lifelong suffering for us, stand or fall together. <coughs> that is, if someone believes that Christ suffered for us all his life long, almost invariably he will believe that Christ's obedience for us was all his life long. And if someone denies that Christ's obedience for us was all his life long, he will also deny, typically, that his suffering was lifelong too. The two stand and fall together, typically, in the vast majority of cases. And when I speak about our Lord's lifelong obedience, I mean, as you know, that the Lord Jesus kept the law of God perfectly right from his earliest days to his last breath. Perfectly. Always. We can say this too, that Christ's obedience to the Father was most costly and therefore most glorious to the Father and to the Church. At the end of his life, <coughs> at the cross, and the events leading up to it, this lifelong obedience of the Lord Jesus, his perfect righteousness, and doing the Father's will, that is reckoned to our account in justification. Because our righteousness, with which we stand before God now in the last day, is the life that Jesus lived 2,000 years ago and reckoned to us. We are in justification 
as obedient and righteous as the Son of God, of Him who lived and whose life is recorded for gospel accounts. Now, all the while that Jesus Christ is obeying the law for us throughout his life, he is also bearing the punishment for our sins throughout his life. He's earning righteousness by his obedience, and he's also bearing our sins lifelong. And just as the Lord's obedience was most costly at the cross, the events leading up to it, and he had to pray that the Father would strengthen him to do his will and to drink the cup at Gethsemane. Just as Christ's obedience was most costly at the end, so his sufferings were most terrible at the cross and the events leading up to it. The two go together. Lifelong suffering of Christ, lifelong obedience of Christ, both for us and the suffering most intense and the obedience most glorious at the end. And the reason for this is that the Lord Jesus Christ is our substitute, the one who takes our place. And Jesus Christ is our substitute, not just in his last few hours before he died, or even in his last couple of days, or even in his passion week. Jesus Christ is our substitute throughout his whole life. And as our substitute, he obeyed the law for us on our behalf all his life. And as his substitute, he bore the punishment due to us for our sins all his life. And if you say, that's all very interesting, maybe it's a little bit deep though, but I now want, and I expect you to give them to me, I now want some specific texts from the Bible. That's okay, that's a good question. Give me a chapter and verse. You may say these three arguments help explain things, but give me a text. These three arguments that the state of humiliation, Christ legally being guilty, requires him to suffer for us all his life long. I can see your point. That Christ's lifelong suffering is the other side of his work of lifelong obedience as our substitute. Yeah, I can see that too. And I can see too your point that it is very difficult to limit Christ's sufferings to the cross and not take it back to the scourging and the trial and the arrest and the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane and that cross which loomed over him all his days shadow of but some texts. Let's turn first to John chapter 1. John 1 verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And we're especially interested here in the tense of the verb taketh away. Taketh away is present tense. This verse is not a prophecy, it's not saying, Behold the Lamb of God who will bear and take away our sins on the cross. It's not dealing with the future, it's present tense. It won't do either to say the verb is present tense merely in that the sacrifice of Christ is constantly efficacious so that you, present tense, can know your sins were born away by Jesus Christ. The present tense isn't the fact that you, presently, are forgiven because of what he did. The present tense refers to his bearing away our sins. The 
day in which John the Baptist uttered those words recorded in John 1 verse 29. The Lord Jesus then was currently at that time bearing our sins. Our sins being imputed to him, directed to his account, then called forth from God wrath and judgment so that the punishment which the Father inflicted upon the Lord was an oppressive burden, like a weight pressing down upon him, bringing pain and oppression and suffering. He's the Lamb of God, that one Jesus, to whom I'm pointing you, <coughs> who is currently bearing away the sin of the world. The sin singular, all of it together, of the world. And the world there, by the way, isn't every individual person. It's the world of the elect behind the system. And then I remind you that this word of John the Baptist, the Lamb of God, bearing away the sin of the world, present tense, is at the very start of our Lord's public ministry. Three years before the cross, and he is already bearing our sins. Now he was bearing our sins before John said this of him, and for the next three years. And the weight was especially oppressive on the cross, but at that point, the very start of Christ's ministry, in connection with his baptism, which was the inauguration of Christ in his public office as Messiah, he's already bearing our sins. That is, he knows, I am guilty on behalf of my people. The Father is punishing me on their behalf, and it hurts me. I'm suffering. It's painful. Even then. After John 1, 29, I'd like to look with you now at Isaiah 53 for our second text. Isaiah 53, verse 2, says that the Lord shall grow up before him, that is God, as a tender plant. The Father looks upon the Son in his incarnation as weak and tender and beloved. But then, for us, the church, in this passage especially from the perspective of the Jews, they rejected him, he's like a root out of the dry ground. Now roots aren't particularly attractive. Roots are knobbly and wizened and rather ugly things. And a root out of the dry ground is, if anything, even uglier than an average root. But for us, while the Father looks upon him as a tender plant, daily beloved, for us, in a natural state, he's like a root, but a driver, no form, no humbleness. <coughs> when we see him, unless we're regenerated and get our eyes, spiritual eyes, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. He is a man of sorrows. He is acquainted with grief, and we hid our faces from him and didn't want to look upon him. We despised him and we esteemed him not. That was the way we were before we were regenerated, too. Now, the point is, in this connection, that this was lifelong. Christ wasn't just despised, he wasn't just viewed as a root out of dry ground, he wasn't just rejected, he didn't just experience grief. On the cross, or in his last few hours, this was lifelong. And to make it even clearer, that phrase, man of sorrows, characterizes him not only in his latter hours on earth, his last hours on earth, but throughout his ministry and even before it. A man of sorrows, a man of pains and sufferings and grief. Which pains and sufferings and grief and sorrows that characterize him as a man are substitutionary. As the three verses after verses 2 and 3 state, 
Surely he hath borne our griefs, this man of sorrows, but acquainted with grief. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. Verse 5 states, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And this bit, for our means as a substitute in our place, being punished instead of us. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. It's not amazing. He gets beaten. And there are lashes laid upon his back. And we are healed. Because he is whipped. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And then the substitutionary bit. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Behold, said John the Baptist, the Lamb of God, bearing away the sins, sin of the world. And then the third and final text in this connection, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Hebrews 9, 28, text used by John 1 and Sleeton in this connection. Hebrews 9, 28 states, it draws a parallel and contrast between Christ's first coming and second coming. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, that's his first coming, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Christ was once offered. This once offering of Christ especially refers to the cross, but Christ's whole life was an offering. That is, a willing sacrifice of himself to do the Father's will, to suffer in his name, and to achieve his purposes. Because he always did things which pleased his Father. And that which pleased his Father was to die for the sins of his elect people. And at the end of the world, Jesus Christ will return, as the text puts it, the second time. Only this time, unlike the first time, he shall appear the second time without sin. The first time he came with sin. He came with sin in a way in which nobody else ever was afflicted with sin. Because not just the sin of one person, which is the way it is with you or I, but all the sins of God's people were imputed to him. Though he personally was without sin, by virtue of the imputation of our sins to him, and in that sense, he was the greatest sinner ever. He was the most heavy laden with iniquity ever. So the first time he comes with sin, all our sins imputed to him, but the second time he comes without sin sin. And this again takes us back to the two states of Christ. The state of humiliation. That's his first coming. When he's guilty with our sins legally and therefore he's afflicted with the misery of suffering for us. That's the time when he comes with sin. With sin imputed to him. Then is his state of exaltation of which Christ's glorious second coming is part, when he comes as perfectly righteous and without sin, no sins appeal to him. Instead, is his own perfect obedience to the law. When he comes in glory, the first time he comes with sin, bearing sin, and the second time he comes without sin, in the state of glorification. What dost thou understand by the words he suffered? Well, we understand this, that he suffered all the time that he lived on earth. And we understand this too, that he suffered especially at the end of his life. That is, he always suffered, but there was an intensification towards the end. 
And there are reasons why there was this intensification that are very easy to grasp. He grew older for one thing. It would have been entirely inappropriate for Christ as a three-year-old, because he was a three-year-old, just as he was a four-year-old, that's part of growing up. It would have been entirely inappropriate and unbecoming for Christ as a child to have borne the sufferings that he was later to bear as a man. As he matured, he suffered more. Then too, with the beginning of Christ's public ministry, he bore the punishment of sins more so than before. That is especially why it's appropriate for John the Baptist in connection with Christ being installed into his office by his public baptism to say, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. He's a prophet and a king and a priest and he's bearing our sins as our sacrificial lamb. And then too, as the public ministry of the Lord progressed, more and more people heard and more and more people understood from his teaching what he as the Messiah was all about and what the kingdom was and the life that it required of his citizens and thereby also not just the elect were seeing but the reprobate and ungodly grew in hatred towards him as they understood more. That's what happened too with Judas. Judas was happy enough at the start, he didn't really grasp what Jesus was preaching, but as it began to sink in, he realized, this sort of Messiah is not for me, and his kingdom is not for me either. I have more use for 30 pieces of silver than this Messiah and his kingdom, and so I will betray him. If you had said to him, when Christ called him as a disciple, he would have said, there's no way I'm going to do that, but as it dawned upon him, as his heart was exposed, he came to hate Christ more. And what happened in him individually progressively happened in the populace. Then too, not only as Christ grew and was able to bear more suffering, and of course he was supported in this by the divine nature, and not only as his public ministry began and progressed, but also too, legally, his status before men changed because prior to his arrest and conviction, despite the fact that many hated him, Christ was a free citizen. Before the law of Rome and the law of the Sanhedrin, though many allegations were made, he was a free man. No charge had been sustained against him. Just as you, I take it, are free before the law of the land. A citizen in good standing. But when he was judged guilty, judged guilty by the false church, judged guilty by the state, in this instance the Roman Empire as represented by Pontius Pilate, then he was excommunicated by the church and criminalized by the state. Now he's a malefactor. And then the sentence of crucifixion is passed upon him. Now I don't mean that Christ's sufferings increased merely because man accused, condemned, and punished him. Man, as represented in the false church and an anti-Christian state, rather Almighty God was acting through these ungodly men in church and state. And Jehovah was punishing his son in our place through these processes. And Jehovah was punishing his son above and beyond these things. So that Christ's sufferings were not even primarily in that the people turned against him or the state said crucify him or that he was actually nailed to the tree. But far above and beyond these things was the wrath of God upon his innocent head. God thereby punished his son. God punished his son 
in the arrest in the garden of Gethsemane, it is as if God seized Christ and said, you are guilty. You must be brought to justice. God judged his son at the Sanhedrin guilty of sins against the church and the church is God. God brought Jesus before Pontius Pilate and said of him, because he was guilty for our sins and guilty of our sins against mankind and the state, and said to the Son, you are guilty for all the sins of your people against human race and against the civil government. Why, asked question 38, why did God bring it about that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate as a judge? So that he might be condemned by a temporal judge, so that thereby God would make it clear that his severe judgment was put upon him, Jesus, so that we might not be exposed to it. And then comes the cross. God would have his son to be crucified because hanging on a tree, question answer 39 states, is a death peculiarly accursed of God. And here, Catechism is echoing Deuteronomy 21 and Galatians 3, verse 13. The idea being, you're suspended between heaven and earth so that earth doesn't want you and heaven doesn't want you either. You're in between, rejected of both. God did that. Because Christ was guilty of with our sins. Because of these things, we read most of Christ's suffering for us on the cross and the events leading up to it. If you think of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these four gospel accounts have many verses, even chapters dealing with the crucifixion and the trial leading up to it, and so on. You get the odd verse, like John 1 verse 29, which says that the Lamb of God is currently bearing punishment, but you have old chapters later, like John 19, dealing with his substitutionary death for us, especially on the cross. It's in connection with the cross and his sufferings there that Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He doesn't say that. It wouldn't have been appropriate to, for him to have said that in the middle of his Galilean ministry, never mind when he was 12 and at the temple. It's on the cross that we have the three hours of darkness when God couldn't look at his son because he was, as it were, holy sin for us. There were no three hours of darkness when Christ was preaching on the other side of the River Jordan, for instance. So too, in the epistles we have, for instance, 1 Peter 2 verse 24, Christ his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree. That's especially when he was punished. So we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Referring to his being scourged prior to the cross. And then of course, Isaiah 53, that great section on the suffering servant deals most and especially with the cross. And if we were to take two words from answer 37, we could take others. Two words that explain what's happening here at the cross, we have propitiation. Christ is our only propitiatory sacrifice. He's bearing away not only sins, but he's bearing away the wrath of God due to us for those sins. He's suffering in our place so that God's wrath against us might be consumed and fully taken. 
And the other word here I'm thinking of is redeem. He is our only propitiatory sacrifice that he might redeem our body and soul from everlasting damnation. And redeeming is paying the price, paying the price of suffering, paying the price of suffering here all his life long and his special at the cross. And the result therefore of the cross and the result particularly of the cross and all of Christ's suffering in terms of propitiation is not wrath, but to use another phrase in verse 37, he obtained for us the favour of God. Now this doesn't mean that God hated us and then Jesus came down from heaven, suffered for us so that God changed his mind and God said, now that Christ has borne their sins, I'll have to stop hating them and I will love them. Rather, God eternally loved us before the foundation of the world in Christ. Thereby God sent Christ into the world to die for us so that God's love for us might be manifested to us and be experienced and known by us. But in that Christ died for our sins, the legal basis for punishment is removed, and he buys, purchases for us, obtains for us the right that we can be loved with God's everlasting mercy and kindness, which means peace. And from that other word, redeem, we're redeemed from everlasting damnation so we don't perish in hell because Jesus perished on the cross for us. We obtain righteousness and eternal life. And this is the law of all who believe in Jesus Christ for the first time and throughout their life. Believing on Jesus brings peace, righteousness, and everlasting life for all that are given that grace. Amen. Let us pray.